سام يا دكتور محمد اوكي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاه والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين uh, it's a great pleasure for me to announce the continuation of uh, our banha orthopedic review course uh, as many of our attendees and our colleagues are uh, overseas so we will try to speak in english as much as possible uh, as you know all the banha orthopedic review course comprises two main sections the first part is the orthopedic and the second part is the trauma part the orthopedic we started with the knee section uh, first knee arthroplasty then we will go to arthroscopy then we will go to the hip section then to the foot and ankle and go from foot and ankle to the shoulder and from the shoulder to the elbow hand and finally the spine course and after the spine we will continue with pediatric deformity planning oncology and finally metabolic and neuromuscular disorders after we finish orthopedic course we will go to the trauma course comprising all the uh, trauma of all the regions in orthopedics uh, this course is uh, sponsored by uh, the egyptian orthopedic association and it is certified by uh, banha university to be legalized to have the uh, cme certificate of this course you have to make a registration on the microsoft form uh, as we uh, mentioned in the uh, site after you make the registration you have to attend at least 70 percent of the course uh, we have two sessions before and now uh, the third session of the course is with our dear brother Dr. Professor Dr. Wael Nassar, Professor of Orthopedic Surgery at Shams University. Uh, he will speak to us today about a very interesting topic in total knee arthroplasty, which is total knee arthroplasty, which patient and which, uh, and, and, uh, which uh, prosthesis. It's a very demanding uh, talk we, uh, for myself, Professor Mohammed Al Ashab, head of orthopedic surgery, and all the organizing committee. I would like to thank many thanks, Professor Dr. Wael Nassar, for his precious time that he will spend with us this night. Thank you, sir. Uh, the moderator of this session today is Professor Dr. Hossam El Bigawi, Professor of Orthopedic Surgery, Banha University, and head of the knee arthroplasty and arthroscopy unit in Banha University. Uh, go on, Dr. Hossam B. Thank you so much. Dr. Hassan El Bigawi. Dear uh, orthopedic surgeons uh, all over the world, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Wael Nassar, uh, professor of orthopedic surgery uh, in Shams University. Uh, May you please raise the voice, Dr. Hassan? May you please raise the voice? Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Wayne Nassar, uh, Professor of Orthopedic Surgery uh, in Shams University. Uh, the lecture title is uh, uh, Total Knee Arthroplasty, uh, which procedures for which patient? Uh, Dr. Wayne, uh, Dr. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lashka. Thank you, Dr. Hussam, for uh, this kind invitation. Uh, first, uh, all thanks to Allah for his uh, kindness, support during these hard days that we are all going through before, uh, be because of the pandemic and the quarantine. Second, I'd like to thank Professor Dr. Mohammed al Ashab and his team in uh, Banha University for inviting me to this wonderful and respectable course. Uh, last but not least, I would like to thank uh, Professor Dr. Sufyan, uh, our colleague from Tunisia, because his last presentation made my mission easier uh, uh, for uh, continuing from the point that he stopped with. I would like to start my presentation with this uh, sentence, which I like very much. Fortune and luck loves prepared minds. Uh, going back to our presentation by prepared minds minds we mean you have to see your patient carefully examine your patient carefully spend enough time 
with preoperative planning. If you did these points, your mind will be prepared and the fortune and luck comes to you and your patient, inshallah. Intern intended learning objectives of my presentation is talking about constraints. What do we mean by constraints? Different types of total knee prosthesis, how we choose the suitable prosthesis for my patients, and how to be flexible in shifting from one decision to another decision inside the operation. Knee replacement surgery is a solution to knee pain in over 500,000 patients each year in the United States. About 220 prosthesis being operated every year in my university, in Shams University, average five per week, of which is 30 to 40 revision cases. Aseptic loosening of total knee prosthesis is the most common cause of failure in both the unconstrained and the semi-constrained type of prosthesis. 70 to 80% of cases had the diagnosis of osteoarthritis. 10 to 15 are rheumatoid. Other indications are much less common and includes tumors, AVN of one or more femoral condyles, and other much more rare causes. If we are going to our Egyptian patients, which have certain unique features, sharing with most Middle Eastern patients, patients usually seek medical advice in the advanced stage of the disease, where more conservative techniques in arthroplasty is needed. Varus deformity is much more common than valgus deformity. Flexion is more than recurvator. Most cases have severe varus with severe internal tibial torsion. And we will see it during this presentation what this dictates in our surgical technique and implant choice. Many Egyptian primary total knees is comparable to difficult revisions in Western countries. Augments, blocks, and extension stems should be available on shelf to avoid unhappy ends for you and your patients. This is one type of a primary knee uh, osteoarthritis that we see in our clinics in Egypt and in other Middle East countries. The patient usually is reluctant to seek surgical treatment during early phases, and he is postponing the surgery, taking more medications, more analgesics, till he come with such a picture which is much more comparable to difficult revision cases in many Western and US countries. Prosthetic options. If we are uh, talking briefly, elderly or logimon middle-aged uncomplicated patients, we usually put cemented, cruciate substituting, stemless fixed bearing, total condylar designs, and then we think if we will resurface the patella or not, the concept of selective resurfacing that my colleague, Dr. Sofian, has talked about in his last presentation. Younger, more active patients, we can go for a cementless total knee, which is uh, uncommon uh, practice in Egypt so far. Ceramic on ceramic total knee, which is yet not available in my country. Mobile bearing total knee with many designs available in the market and in Egypt. Single radius total knee introduced by Scorpion Company, which is called Scorpion 2. Medially biased kinematic knee, or the concept of medial bevot knee, that Dr. Sofian illustrated enough in his biomechanical presentation, presentation about the kinematics and biomechanics in the last presentation. Uh, although it's most recent, but is not yet widely introduced in Egypt. Hyperflex designs available, but more expensive, and you have to talk with your patient about his expectations. Hyperflexed designs is considered and designed to allow hyperflexion of the knee in exceptional situations. And not like many doctors and many companies that propagate for their prosthesis as it is the prosthesis of sitting squatting or sitting cross-legged or sitting in the prayer position. Although the design allows this degree of flexion and range of motion, if the patient is doing this on a daily basis, there will be accelerated wear and he will be faced with an early revision, maybe in the six or seven years post-operative. What are our goals in doing a total knee arthroplasty? We are aiming at pain relief, improving the function of the patient, attaining acceptable stability, 
putting a durable implant and if possible, correction of the deformity as much as we can. Our targets, we have to put the component in good position. We have to respect the limb alignment. We have to get a balanced collaterals and we have to ensure equal gaps. Finally, the suitable implant design. The first four points are covered in the surgical technique, which is beyond the spectrum of this presentation. And this presentation is only for number five, suitable implant design. What are my variables in choosing which implant for which patient? The age of the patient, meaning by the age is the physiological age and the functional demands, not the chronological age. Level of activity, I have seen a few of my patients, 75 and 78 years, playing tennis and playing rugby, sorry, playing golf. And I have seen females at 58 or 59 years hardly wants to go to bathroom and go back to bed. So you have to talk with the patient and to ask the family about the baseline activity. The extent of the pathology, the deformity, bone deficiencies, which I talked about in our primary needs comparable to the severe uh, deficiencies present in uh, difficult revision in other countries and the instability issue. Which is more important? surgical technique or choice of the implants. If you are asking me, surgical technique is the key for success. Choice of the implant is the good tool which could be used by a good surgeon to achieve good results. There are some principles to guide the design of prosthesis which replace the diseased or worn articular surfaces while retaining the ligaments and muscles. The components should be shaped to allow distraction sliding and rolling movements between the bones according to the three axis policy that Dr. Sofian talked about. Components should apply only compressive stresses to the juxtaarticular bone. All surviving soft tissues should be kept and restored to their natural tension and the areas of contact between the prosthetic surface should be large enough to maintain the pressure under load at a level which the prosthetic material can withstand. With the new replacement and the new concept of uh, one day uh, procedure, one day hospital, swift to the knee, the patient should be able to go walking just two hours after the end of the surgery. I like this sentence very much, which is present in every book talking about total knee arthroplasty. The success of a knee arthroplasty is influenced by the complex interaction between the implant design geometry which is our target today, and the surrounding soft tissue structure, which serves to determine the range of motion, interface force, and the stability of articulation, which is the arts of arthroplasty related to surgical technique and experience of the surgeon. If we are talking about soft tissue restraints controlling knee replacement, we have the collaterals in one hand, the medial collateral and the lateral stabilizers, Talking here about the lateral collateral and the posterolateral corner. On the other hand, the cruciates, the ACL, and the BCL. The implant design, we are talking about the constraint, which is the built instability of the implant design, load sharing capacity of the implant, interface forces affecting the bearing and reflected on the wear, tibiofemoral conformity, contact stresses, and kinematics, which are covered in the last presentation. The constraint options is the amount of inherent built instability that the implant provides. The least constraints is the unicompartmental, that's to say you have to have good collaterals, good cruciates, good soft tissue coverage, so that you, have, you need minimal inherent stability in the implant and the maximal stability of the soft tissues. Going a step further, the mobile bearing designs, the gender specific designs, cruciate retaining, Cruciate sacrificing, then the posterior is stabilized, constrained condylar, or in other words, the super stabilized designs, rotating hinge, and finally the fixed hinge. This is the step ladder, continuation, and progress of the constraint. Conformity reflected to contact stress. The more conformity you have, the less the contact stress per unit area, as shown in the right slide our right part of the slide, the less conformity you have, the more stress per unit area 
and consequently the more wear you have. This picture reflects what I'm talking about. If you have this military shoes, it has wide base, strong, distributing the wear on a large surface area, so that allows the soldier or the worker to uh, accept and to do high road activities. While the very nice uh, shoes, feminine shoes in the left picture, although it gives minimal impression, that's hardly noticed, but this impression is profound, and if this works on ceramic or on soft tissues, the stress per unit area gives disastrous and long-standing effects. So the wider the conformity, the less the stress, and the longer the survival. Starting with the least constraint, as I said, the unicompartmental knee, what are the indications? The age of the patient is usually above 60 with low activity, which is changing nowadays. Articular destruction is limited to one compartment reaching to bone to bone, and the concept of anteromedial arthritis is now well pronounced. Stable knee, coronal and sagittal, intact anterior crochet and medial collateral with minimal or no dissection and release on the medial side. If we are talking about the medial unicompartmental, varus deformity should be less than 15, flexion deformity should be less than 15. No inflammatory arthritis, that's to say it's not for rheumatoid or systemic lupus patients. Good range of motion, no or mild but telephumeral arthrosis, and normal BMI. The unicompartmental arthroplasty needs unicompartmental disease. The age, age uh, range is a matter of debate, but nowadays it's more and more decreasing and the limits is acceptable to start to give the patient the offer of a unicompartmental knee is going now and as we have longer long-term results and better long-term results that satisfies us that this prosthesis can stand the test of time. The deformity should be minimal and it is unicompartmental knee concept is not aimed at correcting deformity. Of course it's not for rheumatoid patients. Why? Because in uh, unicompartmental arthroplasty, you are depending on the integrity of the core sheets and collaterals. Rheumatoid disease, on the other hand, is a progressive disease that endangers the integrity of collaterals and core sheets. So you cannot depend on what you cannot justify and cannot trust. You need a functional anterior crochet ligament. This is the baseline and the ideal patient. Although some patients so is talking about if your patient had a deficient ACL, you can do an ACL reconstruction beside your replacement, but this is not the standard. The table femoral tracking should be good or accepted, and the patient should have good preoperative range of motion. Osteonecrosis is a debatable issue. Some surgeons say it's a good indication. Others say that the soft bone underlying the prosthesis makes your uh, possibilities of success is limited. Indication of limited knee uh, replacement, let's say a new compartmental. Unicompartmental disease with minimal or no affection of the other compartments, it could be medial, it could be lateral. Some surgeons now considering bicompartmental uni, that's to say medial uni with lateral uni, provided that the collaterals are okay. Grade one or grade two, patellofemoral cartilage degeneration are not contraindications of medial or lateral uni. Limited patellofemoral replacement, that's to say the patellofemoral arthroplasty is not widely used and uh, worldwide less than 10% of all arthroplasty. The mobile bearing designs, it needs a young active patient. It accepts higher BMI. It needs a stable knee because it depends on the integrity of the collaterals and it needs to reach at the end of your surgery a balanced collaterals and balanced gap. It needs a better preoperative kinematics. It's a load sharing prosthesis, provides better conformity, less contact pressure, but the issue of backside wear is still there. By while bearing designs, we mean that the polyethylene can move in 15 degrees rotation for each side, internal and external rotation on the tibial base plates. And in some designs, it can move anteroposteriorly with translation between 10 and 15 millimeters. 
reducing the wear provided by this type of prosthesis is a matter of debate, but what is not a matter of debate, what will come in the few next slides. The tibial rotation forgiveness. Many patients, especially in the Middle East and in Egypt, when you adjust the rotational uh, uh, design and the rotational position of the tibial implant, you are going in a dilemma, whether to adjust with the tibial tuberosity or to adjust with the anterior chin of the tibia or to adjust with the center of the ankle. And you will spend 10 or 15 minutes in some cases trying to solve this problem. If you are using a mobile bearing design, which allows already 15 degrees rotation each side, you have to worry less about this problem because it's forgiving for 10 or 15 degrees of this rotation. But telephemoral tracking forgiveness, again, it's related to the previous point. If you have TT, TG distance is abnormal and you have uh, uh, some confusion to, to adjust uh, the rotation, this rotation of the polyethylene on the tibial base plate is forgiving in the patellofemoral tracking for you in the operation and for the proprioception of the patient post-operatively. What's not forgiving is the gaps. You have to adjust the flexion extension gaps. You have to adjust the medial and the lateral gaps because if it's not adjusted, your component of bully ethylene may be dislocated. Types of bully mobile bearing designs available is the meniscal bearing, rotating platform, medial bevel, kinematic knee, high flexion mobile knee, and dual tracking knee, which failed to stand the test of time. If we are talking about the patellar, patellar replacement concept, in the current concept joint replacement meeting uh, during the last December in 2019 in Orlando, in Orlando, USA, the consensus reached these conclusions. 50% of them replaces the patella and 50% are not replacing. Advocates of patellar resurfacing claims that the risk of reoperation in patients with non-resurfaced patella is 10 times more in the first two years because of the anterior knee pain. Opponents clarify that this is not a proof that the reoperation is due to patellofemoral problem, but may be due to pro uh, uh, problems other than that, mainly the rotation and the uh, uh, correction of the synovitis. Both groups do peripatellar cauterization in the absence of evidence base for this, and I think this is a common practice for most knee surgeons in Egypt. Use the smallest, thinnest possible components to replace the patella. Remaining thickness should not be, be less than 14 or 15 millimeters. 14 millimeters in females, 16 millimeters in males. So that most of the surgeons now are going for the concept of selectively replacing the patella depending on the patient and the degree of erosion and arthritis in the patellofemoral component. Cruciate retaining designs. If you are planning to retain the uh, posterior crochet, you have to think about many points. First, the preoperative range of motion so that PCL retention is not the implant of a choice if the patient has a significant limitation of the preoperative range. Femoral rollback and should be calculated accurately to avoid increasing the stresses in the posterior part of the polyethylene. Proprioception near normal gait preoperative, stability preoperative, ligament control of horizontal forces, prosthetic cement bone interface wear, but for which patient we offer this design and this choice. We have to think that the posterior cutout for PCL is relatively less conforming, and if you could not balance the tension in the PCL, it's better to shift to the PCL substituting designs. And as I said before, because most of our patients come at, an, uh, uh, at a late stage with severe flexion deformity, severe virus deformity, uh, deficient range of motion, maintaining a good tension after recession or releasing the PCL is a matter of great debate. That's why most of our practice in the Middle East area and in Egypt is going towards the PCL substituting designs. 
What about high flexion knee? When I went in my fellowship in Germany, I asked them, this is, was 2008, I asked them about high flexion knee. And uh, they said, oh, Dubai's knee. You mean the total knee that's propagated in Dubai? They are criticizing the uh, high uh, campaign made beyond this design, providing it as a solution for each patient who wants to, stand, to sit on the ground, to pray every day on the ground, because they said it's not designed for that. It is designed simply to improve the range, to give the patient the choice to make use of his flexion, not to make this five days, five days, five times per day, every day, so that the, whatever polyethylene you, bet, you put there, it will be worn out and you have an early revision. There's some modifications in the femoral component that allows this degree of flexion. The posterior condyles is more spherical. The anterior flange is more uh, away from the anterior surface of the femur. And there is also the changes in polyethylene. What are the uses and uh, reflections of these changes in designs? We have to go to the concept of jump distance. Because the patient will do such a degree of flexion, which is 130 or 140 degrees, you have to have your jump distance lower down. You have to have your design, your jump distance larger than usual, and the contact is lower than normal, so we will not have dislocation of the knee with such high degree of uh, range of motion. Also, there should be modifications in the polyethylene and tibia. This part here is showing the changes between the ordinary polyethylene and the polyethylene of the high flexion design. Again, this is the slide talking about the difference in jump distance and point of contact in high degrees of flexion. This is one of my patients, six months post-operative and two years post-operative. You have the range. As long as the patient has a pre-operative good range, you can reach this range, but you have to warn your patient, this is not for everyday use. This is not for use five, day, five times a day. This is to be used when needed, when you need this degree of flexion as going in and out of the car, as going up from a low chair and such circumstances. Posterior stabilized designs. This is one of the designs, the bisurface knee prosthesis introduced during the early 20, uh, 2001 and 2002. It has a unique bullion socket joint uh, articulation, mid posterior portion of the femoral and tibial component. It's a posterior stabilized. It treats that uh, the, the knee joint as a three joints, tibiofemoral medial joint, tibiofemoral lateral joint, and patellofemoral joint. This is from the uh, biomechanical point of view. The problem is that on the uh, practical uh, basis, it, this design failed to show acceptable, good change in the patient's satisfaction and the proprioceptive uh, rehabilitation for the patient after surgery. That's why it's not widely distributed. Cruciate substituting, it is our workhorse. This is the design that we are doing every day. It allows correction of the severe deformity with a fixed varus or valgus or flexion. It's simpler technique, allows more conformity, increased mobility, it is indicated in different posterior crochet balancing and avoid CISO effect seen in the posterior crochet retaining designs. There are two types of substituting the BCL mechanism, whether the CAM and POST theory or the increased dishing theory. This is the BCL substituting designs with CAM and POST mechanism, whereas the, this is the POST introduced in the CAM of the femoral component. And as I said before, if this post is longer, you have the high flexion knee designs. But I would like to emphasize again and again and again, that's the most important point and indicator for post-operative range of motion is the pre-operative range of motion of the patient. How to substitute the PCL function? We have the command post, we have the increased dishing, and finally we have the hinge. The super stabilized designs, we have a wider polyethylene 
post a larger cam and a more fit here so that minimal degrees of instability in the collaterals and if your patient has a lateral thrust these designs can compensate for this what is the evidence so far there is no clear evidence for possible superiority of the cruciate retaining or cruciate substituting designs if proper patient selection is respected. Medial bevel designs, although promising, but still needs to stand the test of time. Going for the media modularity and the modular constraints, you have to have all this in every knee arthroplasty operation. That's why, or that's because many of our primaries are comparable to the difficult revision. Also, you may have uh, sudden uh, sudden surprises inside the operation as stress fractures, uh, unnoticed preoperative deficiency, fractures of, of uh, one of the condyles, so that you have to have all these in every primary case you have. This is the shape of the lista and posterior femoral augment, although it's mainly used in the patient cases, but you have to have it in each primary case. You have especially difficult cases with high, severe degrees of flexion deformity, of varus deformity, or of bulgous deformity. This is the shape of the tibial augments and tibial half blocks or wedges. And this is the stem extensions of the tibia and the femur. Talking about the stem, we are using more and more stems nowadays, especially in the tibial side. Why is that? Tibial stems in the primary knee is indicated, in my opinion, for rheumatoid patients with poor bone stock. Osteoporotic patients, other than rheumatoids, stress fracture in the tibia, whether evidence before the operation or introduced and diagnosed intraoperative. If you have tibial tubercle osteotomy, if you have a previous high, high tibial osteotomy with the screw holes that makes the uh, part of the bone below the tibial base plate is weak, so have, you have to bypass these weak points of the screws by the stem and, of course, in revision cases. Now we have the cones versus the sleeves that you can use in primary and in revision cases. Of course, in primary cases, we are talking here about the very difficult flexion and varus deformities that you need to compensate for the deficiencies in absence of allografts in my country. The complex primary knees like this knee needs to be prepared with many options in the operation, retaining the final decision after doing the balancing of the gaps with the flexion extension gaps or mediolateral gaps. In older times, we, we, uh, we have more difficult for reconstruction using K wires and screws, putting bone grafts to correct for the deficiencies. But of course, uh, nowadays we have uh, the sleeves and the cones that makes life much easier. This is one case which have a medial defect that's compensated by this half block here, shown, and long stem to bypass the weak part here of the bone. Grossly unstable knees like this knees needs super stabilized or hinged designs. When to use the fully constrained implants? Constraint should only be used in revision or in difficult primary cases after the principles of extension, flexion gaps, and medial and lateral collateral ligaments are well balanced and performed. As little constraint as possible should be used. If stability cannot be obtained, only then progressive level of constraint should be tested and used in construct. Going back to the concept, first surgery, then implant the design and constraint. Fully constrained implants, the tibial and femoral components are linked to each other in a hinge, whether a rotating hinge or a fixed hinge. Advantage stable implants does not require much bony and ligamentous support. Tumor revision case uh, prosthesis can be used in revision cases. Disadvantage, supraphysiological forces produced causes implant and bone wear, especially in the bone cement and cement bone, in the implant cement and cement bone interface. The hinges could be a fixed hinge or a rotating hinge. This is what we mean by the fixed hinge. Although it's much more stable, of course, 
But on the other hand, it puts much stresses on the end of the uh, stem bone interface in the femur and the tibia. It is mainly for grossly unstable knee and for some cases of tumors limited to the articular surface. Here, as we see, the hinge is fixed, allowing flexion extension only, no rotation at all is allowed. For the patient proprioception, patient will be much less satisfied than the patients with a rotating hinge. But on the other hand, if we are talking about stability issue, this is much more stable than the rotating hinge. This is the rotating hinge, allows some degree of internal and external rotation, and allows, of course, flexion and extension. The rotating hinge, you should consider the jumping distance that increases with in lay thickness. There is modular hinge mechanism. There is six anatomical femoral sizes. There is 360 degrees femoral offset. You have bone preservation of the femoral and tibial designs in the new designs of uh, the rotating hinge compared to the old designs. There are six anatomical tibial sizes, 360 tibial offset option in the stem, standard stem and offset stem, cemented or cementless stem extension. This is example of rotating hinge in grossly unstable knee after consuming whatever you need time to get balanced gaps. Tumor prosthesis is the final end when you have no other choice. This is completely constrained, but on the other hand, the soft tissues are declined altogether. More stability is obtained, but much more stresses on the implant bone interface is introduced. That's why it's mainly for very low demand patients and tumor patients. Even with the rotating hinge, you can have this dislocation if you couldn't, you couldn't balance your gaps. So I put this design, this slide at near the end of my presentation to say that whatever the constraint of your design, it's not an alternative for good surgical technique. In conclusion, success of total knee arthroplasty is partially dependent on targeting the right implant design from a wide spectrum of knee prosthesis ranging from unconstrained unicompartmental to fully constrained implants towards the right patient in order to achieve the goals of stability, durability, and total knee replacement. Soft tissue restraints, collaterals in one hand, cruciates on the other hand, you have to have good soft tissue sleeve and balanced collaterals. The expectations, you have your own expectations, you have the patient expectations, you have to tell your patient what's allowed for everyday activity, what's allowed exceptionally, and what's the dangerous activities like contact sports, jumping sports, running, or jogging. Hot topics of today for knee arthroplasty in designs, cemented versus cementless, Ceramic total knee arthroplasty, patella to resurface or not, all bully tibial components coming back again. أنا صوتي مسموع؟ أيوة فندم تمام مسموع دكتور وائل مسموع يا فندم تمام all body tibial uh, components coming back again in low demand patients. Uh, one millimeter increments of polyethylene, yani the polyethylene uh, answers now allowed is not like the old one, nine, then 11, then 13, then 15, it's going one millimeter. Uh, patient specific instrumentation, computer navigated total knee, kinematic versus mechanically aligned knees, Tourniquet use versus carbojet use. Stem the primary knees more and more nowadays. DARE, which is the abbreviation given by the English people for deprivement and implant retention for septic and prosthetic joint infection. SWIFT or fast track total knee arthroplasty. All these are hot topics. Each one of them we can talk in a special and a different presentation. Take hospital because all of us are locked home now, we are not home, so take hospital message instead of uh, take home message. In primary knee arthroplasty, there is no one size fits all. Although design selection is very important, 
But proper patient selection and the meticulous surgical technique remains the key factor for success. Good preoperative planning saves the time, stress, and the cost for the patient and the surgeon. This is the picture with Dr. Al Ashab. Last time we went abroad together in Germany. I hope these days come again. And finally, thank you and stay safe. Thank you, Dr. Wain Bin Nassar, for his valuable uh, presentation. And uh, if there are uh, if there are questions, we can uh, uh, ask. Well, let me ask you a question, please. Sure, sir. Uh, I said to Professor uh, Sofian that the high flexion knee design, uh, we get a larger and uh, bigger range of motion, but I think uh, this is irrespective of the uh, durability of the implant. Of course, the wear rate will be much, much uh, higher than the ordinary designs. You agree with me, sir? Of course. Uh, as I said uh, in this presentation, when I went to Germany, they are uh, talking about high flexion knee as Dubai's knee, yeah. the commercially available knee. Because yeah. uh, in many countries in Western and uh, Middle East, many surgeons provide this for the patient that this is the solution for the problem of uh, brain in sitting position. Uh, this is not designed for that issue. The high flexion knee is designed to allow the patient, which is already have got preoperative range, to achieve this range postoperatively in exceptional situations. Not to be done five times every day, five times per day, every day. Of course, this is allowed by the design, but you will end in a catastrophic early fail. You have a revision after six years, seven years, eight years, and this is not the issue for the design. So the first determinant of the range is the preoperative range. This design is good as long as you and your patient are understanding what it is designed for. Yeah. May I ask another question, sir? Of course, of course. Uh, the second question for you, sir, you know, of course, sir, the, the big debate between the uh, uh, high tibial osteotomy and yoni compartmental knee in medial compartmental osteoarthritis. What do you think about it, sir? I think uh, they are designed for different categories of patients. Yeah. If your patient is a young age group, highly demanding, like working in construction, working a driver, something like this, you need something to withstand such degree of stresses. And I think this operation is the high tibial osteotomy. On the other hand, if the patient is an uh, office worker, uh, middle-aged, especially female or housewife, uh, and needs to go back to her ordinary life in a faster time, with accelerated or shortened rehabilitation, this is the type of patient you can offer for uh, a unicompartmental. So this is, uh, I think it's not different of a decision, it's different in patient selection. Yes, sir. If I make, sir, if I admit uh, unicompartmental knee, does it make uh, total knee replacement more difficult if I need it? No, at all. But on the other hand, uh, you have a lower threshold to change to total knee arthroplasty than the ordinary patient. That's to say, when you do a, a unicompartmental knee for a patient and then he comes after four or five years and complain of uh, knee pain, you directly go for a knee arthroplasty. But if your patient is a genuine knee with no unicompartmental, you expect and expend much more time in conservative treatment, physiotherapy, local injection, and uh, pain control modalities before you can think to shift to a total knee. So doing a unicompartmental knee makes decision for an arthroplasty in general easier and earlier for the patient. Thank you, sir. Dr. Wild Bay, uh, I have two questions. Uh, one from uh, Dr. Osama Abdel Rashid. What about uh, the weight of the patient? Uh, is it direct us uh, or not? Uh, and the other uh, question uh, about uh, the obese uh, patient, uh, what uh, yeah, what about uh, uh, the knee for obese patients and market obese? Okay. In obese patients, uh, there is co two considerations. First consideration is the surgical technique consideration and soft tissue. You have to modify your approach to your handling of the tissue according to this. 
and what they have uh, they have more uh, more and more uh, difficulties and complications as regards the design for uh, observations you have to select the more stable and the higher constraint parts and don't get on the integrity of source issues as you say if you are between you if you are between the ordinary substituting or the super stabilizer, you go for a super stabilizer. You shift a step further because the patient's weight puts much more emphasis on the left. This is one hand. In the other hand, there is more space for a mobile in lines if you can achieve balanced collaterals in such patients because the wear in, uh, uh, is distributed in two surfaces, the femoral tibial contact and the tibial tibial contact surface. Also, there is more room for using stems in the primary surgery for such patients. Second question, Dr. Hossam. Uh, there are two questions also. Uh, one from uh, Dr. Muhammad uh, Qabil. Uh, any clear indications or contra contraindications for uh, poly all polycythemia-based plates? Yes, of course. Uh, the old polycythemia were uh, the original tibial components that was present in the market 20 or 25 years ago. They have diminished and disappeared because of the high wear concern. They are reappeared again in U.S. and in many Western countries because of two concepts. First, uh, concept related to the cost. They are much cheaper than the ordinary uh, uh, metal bag, the tibial components, uh, faster surgical technique, and they are mainly indicated for patients with a relatively low life expectancy. These designs, all tibia polyethylene, are mainly introduced for patients in, uh, in, in the sanitary houses, patients in, the, in shelters, very elderly or in the stage two are patients with advanced osteoarthritis stage of the disease. That's to say, you are putting this old bully tibia in patients with life expectancy when five, six, seven years, something like this. You need a cheap component that uh, puts a lower burden on the insurance system of the country, faster for the patient, faster for the surgeon, forgiving, and not expected to serve uh, high demand or high stress. That's the indication of all tibia. That's why it's coming again these days. Uh, another question, Dr. Weil. Uh, time frame uh, for, uh, to move from partial with bearing to full with bearing with uh, different procedures. This is not related to the implant design. The time for shifting from partial with bearing to full with bearing depends on the uh, surgical technique how much you are uh, confident of your surgery and your balancing your balanced gaps, and the operation of the patient and the rehabilitation with physiotherapy. So this is not something related to the implant design. It's related mainly to the surgical technique and rehabilitation. Uh, another question. Uh, do you recommend uh, using uh, CBM after uh, primary post uh, stabilizing or shape thinning the design? I'm routinely using CPM. I'm routinely using what's known as the AV pump or arteriovenous pump to, as a mechanical, uh, mechanical method to avoid DVT. And I think in the first three or four days post-operative, if the patient is in the hospital, it makes major shifts and major progress in the knee range and the rehabilitation of the patient. Thank you, Dr. Wail Nassar, uh, for your valuable uh, presentation and your valuable uh, lecture. Uh, and uh, thank you, Dr. Mohammed Dashab, uh, for uh, his nice uh, uh, talk. And uh, thank, you. thank you, Dr. Hossam. And thank you so much, Professor Dr. Wail Nassar. Uh, this is a very demanding talk patient selection and implant selection. I think no one can speak about it such like you, sir. It's a marvelous okay. talk and demanding talk. Thank you so okay. much for your precious time. It was a pleasure, sir. Thank you so much. Okay. I hope to see you in, 
many other talks in uh, our course, sir. Inshallah. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm very happy with the, the last picture. Let's remember we with the, the beautiful uh, old days. I hope it will uh, come again, sir. Inshallah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wahid. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we are very, very uh, honored with the presence of uh, our eminent professor, Dr. Wael Nassar. The next uh, talk, inshallah, will be on uh, next Saturday, 20th June. Uh, with, uh, it, it's uh, talking about total knee replacement in deformed knees, varus, valgus, and flexion knee. The uh, speaker will be Professor Dr. Ayman Abid, Munofaya University, one of the superstars of arthroplasty, knee and hip arthroplasty in Egypt. I hope to see you uh, next uh, Saturday, inshallah. Thank you so much. Have a nice night. Thank you.